You are listening to the Retina UK Online Scotland Local Peer Support Group Meeting recorded Tuesday 29th of March 2022. Good evening everyone, this is the Scotland Online Local Peer Support Group and this evening we are joined by Emma Brown um, from Guide Dogs UK for Scotland and Northern Ireland and also we are joined by her colleague Laura Bradley who will be um, talking about her experience with a guide dog. So um, before we do, um, we'll just go around the room and just if anybody wants to say who they are, a little bit about themselves, and then we'll um, hand over to Emma, who will um, start uh, speaking. And in any Q&As after, we can, um, we can get into a Q&A session after that. So, can I ask, uh, just when everyone's introducing themselves, it would be quite helpful if, because I know, for example, I know Colin's got a guide dog, it'd be quite helpful if when you're introducing yourself, if you have any experience using our services if you could let us know as well just so I know so I'm not telling you all about something you already know about um as we're going on. excellent okay well I'll I'll start so my name is Mark Baxter I am the information and support coordinator for Retina UK um, I've been in a role for uh, just over six months now I've got retinitis pigmentosa and at present um no I I don't currently have a guide dog um I use um a white cane at the moment so who have we got next? So um, um, Colin, did you want to say? It's Colin, it's Colin, it's on the, uh, uh, Colin Hetherington, probably known by quite a few of you on here. Um, done quite a bit with Retina UK. Um, actually do quite a lot with Sense, doing quite a lot with Deafblind Scotland as well at the moment. Uh, run Northern Alliance group. Uh, I've got Usher syndrome type three, and I'm now on my third guide dog as of yesterday. So, um, moving forward, <laughs> right? Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Hi, I'm Kim, and I um, have retinitis pigmentosa, and I have an assistance dog currently who's a German Shepherd. And I've just applied to guide dogs to put my name down for a guide dog because I believe it takes about four years. And so I'm just in the, very, in, the, in the process. I've had two chats with people. So that's where I am. And I am being trained to be a facilitator for Retina UK. And I have quite a lot to do with um, visually impaired people in Northern Ireland and in Belfast. And I live in Carrickfergus. And I also um, I'm part of a, a visually impaired group, which is so helpful because it um, tells you all about technology and or just so much information called the VIP group. It's got it's got quite a few um, divisions, but it's it's very interesting. Thank you. Um, got Valerie. Hi, I am. I'm, I'm Valerie Scott. I've got RP, but quite a mild version because I'm still allowed to drive. Wow. Um, not sure for how long, but. Um, and I live in central Scotland, so I help um, do the Edinburgh and East of Scotland group, um, along with Jim, but I think he's golfing somewhere or on holiday somewhere. Um, so we haven't had meetings for a couple of years, but we're hoping to, apart from online, but we're hoping to get that started. Well, there is one booked in for me. So, so I've got a sister who's got RP as well, but neither of us has been at the stage of needing a dog but hi will i go next i'm claire i'm claire mcclaverty i'm in glasgow um i currently work for um, visibility scotland um have done so for about two years now and i've got retinitis pigmentosa um and I, because I did here, it was such a, a long road into guide dogs. I'm on my first, I'm going to have my second conversation tomorrow. Um, but I, I don't feel quite, I'm not at the stage yet where I um, would need a guide dog if they offered me one tomorrow. But I do feel that my eyesight has gone downhill somewhat, far more quickly post 
turning 50 than uh, I would have liked, but still, I'm quite lucky. I've still got quite broad range at the moment. Um, yeah, so that, and oh, and I also am volunteering for Retina to help out with the local meetings and everything. Fabulous. And I think we have, thank you very much, Claire. I think we have uh, a, a Monica. Does Monica want to say a little bit? She is muted. No, no. Okay. Um, well, um, thank you everyone for, for, for joining us. And um, so um, I'll pass over to um, Emma to um, talk about some of the services and then Emma can then pass over to Laura to talk about her experience with her uh, guide dog. So. Perfect. Thanks. Um, I'll keep it fairly informal just um, just because there's a, a few of us. Um, it's really nice to meet you all. Um, Colin, I know it's, uh, I've known you for a while, but it's been a while since we've chatted. Um, so yeah, nice to, nice to see some familiar faces. Um, so I'm Emma Brown. I work for Guide Dogs Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, my job is called the Services Marketing Officer. So I'm really there to promote our services um, and spread the word on what we do so that people that could benefit from our services know that they can come and, and chat to us. Um, I have worked for Guide Dogs for eight years and in fairly similar roles, to be honest. Um, so yeah, so that's me. Um, Guide Dogs as an organisation, I think I know a few people have mentioned kind of maybe feeling like they don't need a dog. I think the one thing that I'd love you all to leave here today thinking is that Guide Dogs as an organisation offer a lot more than just the dogs. Um, so we're kind of aware that not everyone is at a stage of needing a dog and even people who maybe could benefit from a dog, not everyone wants a dog as well. So it's kind of knowing that we offer some other things and how they might help you along the way as well, depending what stage of your sight loss journey you're at. Um, and the other big takeaway about our charity is that we work with children as well as adults. So I think that's something that's maybe not as well known. I think we're, we're very well known for the fact that we provide guide dogs, but um, not so commonly known about all the other things that we can offer. So today I'm just hoping to share with you some of the services that we have. Um, they might benefit you or they might benefit somebody you know if you know if you're supporting groups and things as well you might come across people that could benefit from them. Um, so I will start with our adult services. One of our, our newer services that we've got is really there for people who um, just need a wee bit of support at home and it's really it's, it's information and advice that we can offer so we've really updated our guide dogs website there's lots of different um, topics that people can go on and read up on for hints and tips on coping at home so things like personal care so like shaving makeup um, cooking um, how to organize things in your cupboards and um, how to differentiate between shampoo and conditioner uh, lots of different just suggestions on things that people have found helped them that you might find help you. And it was a way of us being able to support people maybe at an earlier stage of their sight loss journey um, or people who, like some of you said, don't feel like they need a dog or they don't need our services, but they might benefit from just some wee suggestions that we've got on our website. And just on Saturday there, hot off the press, we released on our Facebook page a video on cooking. So it's quite a long video, it's about 15 minutes. Um, and it's um, a person with sight loss who's chatting to like a food blogger. Um, and they're just, they're in the kitchen making pizza and they're just chatting through some of the different techniques that they're using. Um, so it's quite a nice, quite a light watch. Um, and there's an audio described version as well. So I can always put the link in the chat later uh, when we're chatting. So yeah, so just the, those those pages on our website are not very well known about. So it's really just sharing them. And if you know anyone that's kind of asking for some ideas on, on coping at home, um, they might find something on our website that would be of use to them. So our other main adult service apart from our guide dog is called My Sighted Guide. And this is a, a volunteer led service. So again, nothing to do with dogs. Um, it's volunteers who we would recruit and train in sighted guiding and then match them up with somebody that's looking for a wee bit of support to get out and about. Um, a lot of people think they might refer to it as befriending, but there really is a mobility element to it. So the idea is really to help somebody get out and about. So it's not a case of just popping around for a cup of tea. It's 
going out and getting people moving and if somebody maybe needs a bit of support to like go to the theatre or just go go out for a walk and get more familiar with the local area then a volunteer might be able to help with that um, the service does rely on volunteers so sometimes people might apply for the service and there might not be an available volunteer in their area in which case we would need to recruit sort of specifically around that area and in more recent years we've really targeted our volunteer recruitment so if we had somebody who wanted the service in a particular town we can look for a volunteer in that area who maybe has similar interests as well to to kind of pair up with the service user and the idea is they meet around once a week and um, just for a couple of hours just to get out and about um, our other kind of service that goes along with the My Sighted Guide is we can offer training for your friends and family in Sighted Guiding. So if there's maybe, maybe you don't want a volunteer to go out and about with, but maybe you sort of sometimes take the arm of a friend or a daughter or a, a partner um, and they might be self-taught in Sighted Guiding. So we can offer a short training session for them, just top tips on how to guide and how to offer assistance, maybe just to improve their confidence. Um, and improve their skills on guiding you just to make it a bit safer for, for everyone involved. Um, and those sessions are open to anyone, to be honest, and they're free for the people to come along to. They're run virtually, so we've got, at the moment, we're running them about twice a month um, by our staff in Scotland, and it's about an hour and a half on Zoom. And it's quite a small group, so the person can ask questions and things as well, um, and they're not in front of a huge crowd. Um, so quite a nice, quite a nice wee offer for if you know anyone that could benefit from it. And if there are people who could benefit but maybe don't want to come to the training sessions, we've got wee videos on our website as well about how to how to guide. And they break it down into different wee sections like going through a doorway or getting in and out of a car and um, sort of supporting somebody with going onto stairs and things. So they're all they're all split up. Um, and. I, I should move on to our guide dog service as well. Um, so as a lot of you will know, because I know some of you have guide dogs, some of you are in the process for guide dogs, so you've maybe heard a wee bit about it. Um, but our guide dogs are there as mobility aids, so to help somebody with a visual impairment get out and about safely. Um, they're there to stop people bumping into things. They would stop at curbs to stop people stepping out onto the road. Um, Look, seeing all the obstacles that are coming towards them, so whether that's static obstacles or people and trams that are moving and taking somebody around all these obstacles. I'll not steal Laura's thunder too much because I know that's uh, what she's here to talk about mostly, so I'll save, I'll save the delights of guide dogs for Laura. Um, but our kind of our eligibility criteria really is if someone's struggling to get out and about because of their visual impairment, um, then we can we can sort of chat to you about a guide dog. You don't need to be completely blind to apply for a guide dog. And in fact, most of our guide dog owners do have some residual vision. Um, there's also no age limits. I think a lot of people, a lot of older people think they're too old for a guide dog. Um, and actually, if they are fit enough to use a dog, fit enough to look after a dog, then we can assess them for the, the guide dog. Um, we can also support with costs as well um, and no lower age limit for a guide dog either so a lot of younger people might think they need to be 18 but that's not the case um, although it does need to be the right thing for the young person and um, so definitely something we would consider um, for younger people applying. So our, our children's services that I mentioned um, we have quite a lot on offer for children with a visual impairment starting from birth so we've got an early years session that we've set up for, for kids with sight loss, and that's for children aged zero to four, and it's called My Time to Play. And it's really, as it, as it sort of says on the name, it's play sessions for children with a visual impairment, and it's led by our habilitation staff, and that's the staff at Guide Dogs that have um, got a qualification in working with children with a visual impairment. And these sessions are there um, for the, the parent to come along with the child, siblings can come to, um, it offers a bit of peer support for the parents and um, the kids can play together and they're, they're, they do some sensory games and songs and stories and um, so it's aiming to develop the, the child's skills so things like coordination and communication and balance and um, all through quite a fun environment 
um, but it's all but it's all kind of play and and songs and nice things. Um, so at the moment there's a virtual offer, so anyone in the UK could join my time to play virtually, um, and it's a seven week block and it's free for the family. But we've also got face to face sessions planned in Edinburgh and Hamilton this spring as well. Um, and then towards the end of the year, there'll be different locations depending on where we're hearing from families. So, so if we've got a number of people um, interested in a particular area, then we could look at setting up one there. Um, so it's really nice, nice wee program, um, and we've had some good feedback so far on my time to play. We've also on our website we've got some resources that parents can use at home or parents and carers can use at home with the kids too. So we've got a song book that's got songs and suggested actions that go along with it um, that the, the families could do themselves at home to sort of keep up the work. The other service we've got for children is called Buddy Dogs. And you might you might have heard of these dogs. So they're dogs who we have bred and trained with the aim of becoming a guide dog and then they've not quite made it at the end so they've gone through a lot of the training and then just not quite got to the standard we need them to be at to be a guide dog um, however they're still uh, well behaved and well trained and it would be a bit of a waste to not um, be able to use them in some way to support people with sight loss so we can give them out as pet dogs to families where there's a child with a visual impairment um, and they are they are just a pet so they're not there to do anything fancy and um, no guiding but they're there a nice sort of calm adult dog that's less likely to be jumping up um, as, as a pet dog to encourage exercise with the child to encourage um, them to want to go out and play and want to take the dog out a walk and um, so yes yeah, so we've got buddy dogs available for children aged four and above um, we also offer grants for children up to the age of 18 for technology um, and for sensory play equipment as well. So um, there's some different eligibility criteria on those on our website, but, but children under the age 18 might be able to benefit from that. Um, we also have custom made large print books for children and young people with a visual impairment. So that actually goes up to the age of 25 um, and it's called Customize. And we can take a book um, which is already available and turn it into the right format to suit somebody. So if they need a particular sized font or they need particular spacing or they need a particular coloured paper for the text to be on, then we can design the book and print it the way that somebody needs it to be able to read it independently. Um, and the, there is a charge for it, but it's the RRP price that the book is sold at in the, the standard format as well. And then our last sort of children's service is our family events. So historically, we would have done a family event every year. We'd have invited um, children with a visual impairment and families along just to enjoy a day out um, at a reduced price and be able to meet other families and just meet our staff and, and have informal chats with people. Um, <clears throat> COVID has really impacted that, so we've not managed to do that for a couple of years. Um, but this summer, we are booked in for Blair Drummond Safari Park in July, um, and we're hoping that we can get some families along and just enjoy a nice day out with them in the summer. Um, I've been along before to the event, and it was it's really good. The, the staff there are great, so we have a gazebo that the families can come to, and the staff will um, bring out bring out things that the children can get really hands on with and see things up close. So the types that well, the, the one thing that stands out for me from the last time was the dead snake skin that they brought out and everybody was getting to feel it and, and have a good look at it up close. So it's quite nice in that respect for the children. Um, so with our, any of our services really, there's lots of information on our website and all the kind of eligibility criteria. Um, I know somebody mentioned having a second conversation. So the way our application process works is if someone was interested in any of our services, they would phone a central phone number, we call it guideline. Um, they would phone up, have a chat. Our, our application process looks very much at how people are managing just now, what the difficulties are, where people are kind of aiming to be, and then trying to work out which services might be able to support somebody to get from where they are now to where they're hoping to be. Um, and that is through a, a series of different conversations. So you'd have one conversation, have a wee break, and then move on to your next conversation to sort of keep that going. And then from there would be kind of referred on to the, the relevant staff member, depending if it was 
the guide dog service or the sighted guide service or um, friends and family training. Um, so I can pop up the, the phone number in the chat, but it is on our website as well. So it's just guidedogs.org.uk and you would find anything you were looking for there. We do also have a, a sort of online form people can fill in to request a call back as well. So if somebody, if you didn't want to phone guideline, you could just pop your details in and they would ring you to get the ball rolling. Um, I'll maybe hand you over to Laura just now and then once Laura's finished, we can open the floor up to any questions that you have. So I will pass on to Laura, who always speaks so much better than me. Um, so you're in for a treat tonight to, to hear Laura's chat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emma. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Laura Bradley, and I live in a wee town in South Lanarkshire called Blantyre. Um, I have a form of retinitis pigmentosa, which is called Labour's congenital amaurosis, which incidentally I didn't wasn't actually diagnosed with until I was 34. Um, so when I was younger in the 80s, sorry, showing my age, um, I went to numerous eye hospitals where they just get, say that the condition called macular dystrophy, which after so many um, tests and things, they seen that I had scar tissue in the back of my eyes. But when I was younger, it didn't really affect me. I was lucky. My sight wasn't too bad. I had um, fragmented vision. I had some blind spots, but it didn't. Growing up, it didn't really affect me. I went to a mainstream primary school, high school, left high school, got a job, uh, had a few jobs, and it wasn't until 2006, when I was 25, um, I'd noticed a slight deterioration in my sight. Uh, which meant I had to leave my job. I worked in a factory, worked with machinery, and it wasn't safe for me to obviously use these things anymore. So I was registered blind. But even then, it was such a surprise because I didn't notice that much of a difference. I just... So I, I coped with it fine because I thought, well, that's fair enough. I've got a registration now for my, my condition, but my sight wasn't really much different from what it had been before. Um, so at that point, I decided to go to college um, I'd heard through social work because I had to look at different benefits and things obviously because I wasn't working um, I had to see about benefits of what I could get and they'd suggested that I do a, a computing course at college and it was um, a VI course and it was basically a course for visually impaired people to learn to use a computer um, with assistive technology if I ever needed it and it was really good because I learned how to touch type I learned about the different softwares that were available, like magnifiers, screen readers. Also managed to get a higher in English um, when I was at college as well. So I continued doing that for a year and I met really lovely people because this is the first time I'd ever met anybody who had a visual impairment. So, because all my friends were just um, sighted. So I'd, I'd, I never lived as a blind person ever. And I enjoyed the computing course so much that I decided to stay at college and do an IT course. So I then got an HNC in IT at college. And in 2011, I went to university um, and got a degree in IT. And the year just must have been 2013, kind of end of 2013, beginning of 2014. That's when I started to notice a really big difference in my sight. Um, over the years, the, the sight in my left eye had gradually gone, which just left it kind of bloody. Um, central vision was really bloody in my left eye. Still had peripheral vision, but of, you can't focus with that. Um, and it was still quite fragmented as well. So it wasn't until, so I relied on my right eye. Everything I did relied on my right eye. And up until this point, I could still re read standard text as long as it was in a bright enough light. Um, and that's when I noticed that it started to slowly but surely go. And I actually noticed it when I was on holiday with my friends in Gran Canaria. And it was really, really sunny. I've always been affected with glare, but I just put it down to the lovely Gran Canarian sun because I had loads of distortion in front of my eyes. Um, if you imagine, when I try and kind of tell people what, it, what I can see, it's like looking at really, really bright light and then looking away and loads of wee floaters and things. And I started seeing that in front of my eyes and I just thought it was the, the, the lovely sunshine. But then when I got home from my holiday, 
it was still there and I just I've, I've always been a really confident person and I just lost absolutely all the confidence I had totally went into a really bad depression started to kind of isolate myself from my friends my family and it affected them if my mum and dad too I'm really really close to and my brother they live really nearby so they my mum could pick up that something was wrong and when I look back on that time I think I was just I was so I was so proud of being able to see I was so proud I didn't want anybody to know that I had trouble with my eyes even when it was, when I was young I still didn't want people to know and it, it continued like that and the thought of needing assistance needing a mobility aid absolutely horrified me um so rather than uh, the anxiety was terrible I remember the even short journeys to the shop I've got a shop at the end of my street or a dentist appointment a doctor's appointment I remember the anxiety would grip me as soon as I walked out the front door because I was so terrified of tripping down a curb, walking into a fence, like trying to find gates, trying to find doors, walking into people, walking into pavement furniture where maybe people were doing um, roadworks or anything. And just because people didn't know, so I'm going to bang into people and I was just so embarrassed, absolutely, totally embarrassed by myself. And it, to the extent where I would shuffle along the street and the anxiety would grip me so hard that I would stop sometimes and pretend I was looking in my bag. And it was just because I was so anxious and trying to gather myself. So eventually I decided the anxiety was too much and I started just staying at home. Um, friends would ask me to go, go, out, go to the pub, go to the cinema, go shopping, and I'd just make excuses. And some of them kind of drifted away. Some of them are still my friends. Um, and it was Christmas 2014 um, my mum had phoned and she said right Laura I'm going to come over we'll put your Christmas tree up cheer you up a bit and I remember there was a, a, a programme a charity show on the TV called Tech Santa where every year they pick four or five charities and in this particular year one of the charities they were supporting was Guide Dogs and it was showing people like celebrities it showed like I remember seeing like a Simon Cowell um was like meeting guide dog owners and just they were telling him how the difference that the guide dog had made to their life and I remember thinking I wonder if and my mum didn't say anything I didn't say anything and but you know for the next couple of days I was thinking I wonder if that would be something that would suit me I didn't know anything about guide dogs um and I looked up the number and I phoned the next day to just make an inquiry I said I really don't know anything about guide dogs. I don't know if I'm eligible. I would just like to find out some information about possibly applying for a guide dog. Um, so they took all my details. And a couple of weeks later, uh, I got a phone call from, in fact, lovely Emma Brown, um, who was at the, Emma had worked at guide dogs at the time. She was an engagement officer and she had um, phoned, she would come out and do, at the time, it's, the process has changed now, like Emma said, they now do first and second conversations for any services at Guide Dogs. But at the time, it was a general information visit and Emma had come out to visit and that was your kind of first step into your application. Um, and then after my first, that I, did a, I had to do a mobility assessment and that was where one of the orientation mobility specialists came out. And they'll just kind of check, briefly, can I get, do we kind of eye test with you? They'll take you out, you'll go a walk just to see how your mobility is and I did a wee short walk from my house to the shop shuffled along the street and unfortunately for me it was bindy um, and it wasn't even the, the black bin that went out that day it was a blue bin the recycled paper bin and I think I had every bin in the for leaving my house to coming back um, and so I did that and then in that time because I'd never needed a mobility aid up until now or until I came to terms with the fact that I needed one, um, Guide Dogs provided long cane training for me. Um, so I did a 10 week course um, with one of the orientation mobility specialists to learn to use a long cane. And even in that time, the long cane kind of brought my confidence back a wee bit. It was just so nice to, to start to walk again and know if there's obstacles. And I remember thinking, people's going to see me with this long cane. They're going to know I'm blind. And you know, 
uh, what I learned at that, that point, I thought the only person that's bothered about your sight loss is you. You're still the same person. Nobody treats you different. But some people were so surprised that I had I had uh, sight loss because I'd, I just coped with it for all these years. And then even when the sight was really bad, I still managed to try and hide it. I don't know how, because there were several times when I'd walked into doors or bumped into people. Um, so once I did my long cane training, I then went on to the next stage um, of the, the application, which is a guide dog assessment. And that's where one of the guide dog mobility specialists, they come out and they can, uh, they, they do a walk with you as well, with a dog or either on a short handle um, way them can at the end of the handle and this is just to see how you are giving commands which are just to see what your dog handling's like um what speed you walk things like that and they'll also ask you um, if you get any preferences to the type of dog the breed of dog and for me i'd never had a guide dog in my life so i had no preferences whatever was meant to be for me would be and I then get put in the waiting list in September 2015. And that's when I was actually in Oxford. I was, it was to see if I was eligible for a, a gene therapy trial. And that's when they'd found out that I had Leber's congenital amaurosis. Um, so I went in the waiting list. And at that point, I decided to maybe become a, I decided to volunteer for guide dogs because I had my degree in IT and I thought this would boost my confidence and help me get back into a work environment. Um, so I started volunteering at the Glasgow community team, which is in fact in a wee town called Hamilton, which is right next to where I live. And it's really close by. Um, I started doing admin support there in the January 2016. And then I got a phone call kind of late January 2016 one of the, the guide dog mobility specialists to say we'd like you to do a wee walk um we've got a wee dog in here we'd like you've never done a, do a proper dog walk before we'd like you to do one and I was like all right okay um so the next day they he came out and he brought a wee we golden retriever across a labrador called autumn um and we did he put our harness on and we walked from my house in the supermarket which is about 15 15 minute walk and you know even right then, just I felt so relaxed. It was just so nice to walk and walk like a normal person. I, 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 I didn't shuffle. I just kept pace with Autumn. Um, so the walk went really well. I was then asked to do a walk the next day and I just so happened to be in the, the Glasgow office volunteering and we did another walk round about the, uh, the streets in Hamilton. And I'd say to the instructor, Simmy, when we finished the walk, I said, so is Autumn set to go to somebody? Is she go some if you got somebody in mind? And he said, Laura, ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies. And I was like, okay. So next day, a couple of days later, I was back in volunteering and Simmy had come in and he'd said, um, when you've got a wee minute, can we have a wee chat? And uh, I saw him into where he was he was in his his office and Autumn was there and another training dog and his pet dog was there as well. And he said, have a wee seat. And he said, so we've took it to the team on Monday, uh, the, the, on Monday there, and we've all decided that Autumn's a perfect match for you. And I burst into tears, and she put her wee head in my knee and kind of blinked up at me and was like, hello. And, uh, you know, I was so lucky. I only waited four months for Autumn. Um, I think she did a, a few walks with other um, people on the waiting list, but it, it, they weren't suitable. She wasn't suitable for them, they weren't suitable for her. And it just so happened that the, the, the criteria that she had, the things that I needed uh, were all there in autumn and, and they matched us. So we started training um, in February 2016, 29th of February. And I tell everybody, she's my really weird doggy. And the training at the time, it, it, the training now takes five weeks. You do two weeks residential training at a hotel and three weeks at home. And Colin, who qualified yesterday, will know that, that that's the kind of training you do. But at the time, it was two and a half weeks. So I did my training from home. We went do uh, do different routes, routes that I would use every day, supermarket, hairdresser, dentist, into Glasgow, into Hamilton, shopping, lunches, dinners. We'd done all the routes. And, you know, I just did a new lease of life. 
just getting up in the morning and worrying about the, sa the same things that people worry about every day, like, is it going to rain? Do I need an umbrella? Do I need my sunglasses? Where will we go for lunch? Whereas for years I'd worry about, is it really bright outside? What if there's roadworks? What if there's th things on the pavement? What if it's really busy? What if I can't find that door? What if I, I struggle to go on that bus? And the anxiety was just, it disappeared. Just that even in the first couple of weeks of having autumn, the anxiety just went. And now we are six years into our partnership and she's actually celebrating a birthday. It'll be a birthday in two weeks time and she's going to be eight. So I've had autumn for six wonderful years and she's absolutely changed my life. I, and I say this to people and I don't, obviously speaking to people who have got um, visual impairments as, as well, I, I'm actually happier now with sight loss in autumn than I was ever before when I had sight. If that, I, mean, I never had a great sight, but my life's more structured now. I've got this wee dog who's just, she doesn't know how good she is. She's just happy to be with her mum. And um, she's totally changed my life. We can go anywhere. I don't need to worry about nothing. We can even go traveling. She goes to London. I can go places by myself, whereas before, I would struggle to walk to the bus stop because the anxiety was just so bad. And now, honestly, I've just, she gave me my life. She gave me my life back. And it is, um, Mark has stated at the start, I'm actually Emma's colleague now. So in 2017, I was still a volunteer for Guide Dogs. Uh, I started being a fundraiser, a speaker. Um, and in 2017, a job came up in the operations support team at Guide Dogs which I applied for and got. So I've actually been working with guide dogs. It'll be five years this September. And I get to help people who are just like me. Um, I support the technical team. I, su I support other service users when they start training with their dogs. I liaise with vets, I order dog food, equipment, basically anything the technical team needs, the operation support team are there to do. And honestly, I know and bias, but guide dogs absolutely have changed my life. And that's my story. <laughs> thank Thanks, you. Laura. Thank you so much. That was really, really inspiring. You know, thank you very, very much for that. I think that would, uh, anyone that's interested in getting a guide dog, I feel that that story will truly inspire them to pick up the phone um, and make that um, make that leap um, in order to get a guide dog, you know. So thank you so much for opening up and sharing that story. Um, it was very powerful. And thank you very, very much, Emma, for um, telling us all about the services that uh, guide dogs um, actually provide, not just the dogs themselves, but some of the other support services as well. Um, you know, very, very beneficial for the uh, sight loss community. And um, has anybody got any questions for um, either Laura or Emma regarding um, their talks this evening? Oh, Emma. Everyone, I'm, I'm really, Colin. I'm really can you drop me an email, please, with mm -hmm. all, all details, and I can pass it on to uh, a few others, if you don't mind. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you. Um, it might be worth, I know somebody at the start had mentioned kind of waiting times for a guide dog. Um, it might be worth kind of, and Laura can explain a little bit about matching and things. So I think it's maybe just worth to mention that. Um, like our wait, our waiting times, it is a wee wait for a guide dog just now and COVID certainly hasn't helped that. Um, we had to stop breeding the dogs during COVID because we couldn't ship them out to the, the volunteers to look after them and we couldn't train the dogs the way we wanted by getting them into shops and onto public transport and things so we have um struggled in the aftermath of covid but we are trying our best to get back on track but laura spoke about the matching so the way we pair somebody on the waiting list with a dog it's not necessarily um that the next person gets the next dog it's very much looking at like the activities the person does so like laura is quite a busy person and quite sociable so she needed a dog that was going to keep up with her whereas like an older person that maybe just goes to the corner shop a few times a week would, would need a dog that's happy to go at a slower pace and things. Um, so yeah, so very individual circumstances when you're applying for a guide dog. So it's not necessarily a certain number of years waiting list. It's very specific to you and your needs. 
Yeah, yeah it's just really if the, the right dog comes uh, for the person specification, like right. as Emma said, I travel quite a lot. Autumn absolutely loves being in the bus, the train, the underground, but there is some of the dogs that come through who they're not very comfortable in public transport, so that would be more suited to somebody who likes to walk everywhere or somebody that's a wee bit older who only goes kind of out a couple of times a week. So it's just it's, uh, the dogs, because this dog, the dog's going to be there with you for the best part of eight, eight nine, ten, eleven years well, in retirement, but the dog's going to be working for the dog's usually about just before they're usually fully qualified, well, fully trained by the time they're two. Um, obviously, COVID's going to put a damper on that um, with the, the, the breeding and things being halted. So, some of the, the training dogs that we've had have been in training a lot longer. So, they may be kind of closer to three. But again, as Emma said, it's starting to kind of even itself out now. We're getting loads of dogs in um, through training. So, they're hoping to possibly at least 40 partnerships um, for each site per year. And it's so, which is really good. Laura and Emma, um, but especially like Laura, I absolutely adored your 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 talk. I mean, oh, just, thank you I, so much. I, I like had tears in my eyes, and I was so beautiful. <laughs> I just identify so hugely, like with the pride aspect of it, and yeah. just how you don't ask for help and you struggle on. And it's just like even like to, you know, like today I'm like doing my mom's laundry. It's like so hard. I can't see the dials. God, yeah. it's a struggle. And I don't want people to know just quite how hard it is, you know, but I just I just related to so hugely to your to your story. And I mean, yeah, I'm so glad that you've got such a beautiful autumn with you. And and how long can you keep your dogs for? I mean, like when do the dogs have to retire? Or is it when they when they've had enough? Or uh, it just depends. If the if the dog's still healthy enough and still quite happy to work, they'll leave them till they're about 10. Yeah. Um, so autumn's got another couple of years of working left, but sometimes they're, they're never going to force the dog to work. To work, sometimes they decide a wee bit earlier that they don't want to do it anymore. Um, yeah. And then where, once they do retire, the guide dog owners always get the first option to keep the dog because they've it? lived that they've, they've lived with that person for so long. And that, I mean, I'm autumn's mummy. She yeah. even though she's been kind of in different homes through her training, she's been with me for six years. I'm her mum. Um, yeah. And if I if I can keep her uh, as the option to nominate a home for her, um, but I've got a really close family, so Autumn will stay with me, or my mum and dad will rehome her. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and if if again that's not an option, we've got an amazing rehoming service at Guide Dogs where we've mm -hmm. got a big long list of people who are so more than happy to rehome <laughs> a retired guide dog. One that's not quite made it, a withdrawn guide dog. Uh, my mm -hmm. mum and dad actually became new homers for guide dogs um, three years ago, and they've got Clover. Clover was never oh, uh, suitable wow. for a guide dog. She's absolutely crazy. <laughs> and she's five now, and you just adore her. Oh, really? It's just so, so <laughs> wonderful. And Emma, your your um, talk was so interesting as well. But what exactly will a guide dog do? Like I noticed that you were, you spoke about, can a guide dog find a door handle for you? Laura, do you want to answer this one for Autumn? What kind of technically what she does for you, what you yes. ask her to find and things? Yep. So uh, well, the train is slightly changed now. So Colin's probably quite a good person to explain the training now but when I was training so basically they worked like a kind of grid system and you put the harness on and they, they listen people will say oh does she know will she if you say take me Asda will she take me Asda take me at the pub will she go to the pub and I said no so basically we give them commands we give them the forward <laughs> command and autumn if she's working along walking along the street she gets to a curb so she gets to a down curb she'll sit at the curb and she'll wait for me so she doesn't need technically people say oh will she cross you across the road no I've got to get us safely across the road so that's why it's sensible to use crossings and things so she'll sit at a down curb and then I'll give her a, a, a forward command she'll go across the road and come up onto the, the up curb and then continue on so then if we come in at the next one say I want to turn left Autumn will go up to the curb and she'll sit at the curb, and what I'll do is I'll do a back turn, so I'll kind of turn 
my right foot out and kind of pat my leg, my right leg, and Autumn will come round me and then go round to the left. So, Aww. and then they, so they do that for right turns as well. And now they kind of teach them um, just when I was just qualifying with Autumn, they were teaching um, them to find like, the poles and things for when you're crossing. So Autumn kind of got the, the tail end of that training. So if I'm approaching a crossing, Autumn will go up to the pole and she'll touch it with her nose. Wow. Just to indicate that. So I can press the button and then she'll go and sit at the curb. But she gets oh. loads of praise for it. Sometimes she gets a wee bit of kibble. Um, when we're going into, so again, street furniture, Autumn will, she'll assess that when she's approaching it just to see what they call it is they call it is right shoulder work. So they'll she'll assess the situation to see if there's enough space for her and me to get through. And then if there's not enough space, because obviously you get especially in Bindi, where you've got your bin neatly up against your fence for it to be emptied. But then when it gets emptied, it's like halfway down the street, in the middle of the street. And so sort of autumn will assess that situation. Is there room for me and my mum to get through there? If not, what they'll do is she'll take me to the curb and she'll do an off curb manoeuvre, which is basically she'll go to the curb. I'll say, right, okay, find the way straight to the curb. And then so she'll kind of keep as close to the curb, but on the road as she can, and then take us safely back onto the pavement after the obstacle. Uh, she also finds doors as well. She's quite clever. She knows how to find that, an elevator as well. So if I'm in, say, a train station, I don't know. I'll say to you, Autumn, uh, ele- well, I want to say find the elevator. It's a good Scottish word, but we call it a lift. I'll say, right, Autumn, find the lift. And she'll okay. go trot around and kind of have a wee look and then go, oh, right, the lift's over there. Right, Mum, let's go. Um, find train doors. She'll find me a seat on the train, on the bus. Um, she'll, again, when we're approaching stairs, she'll put her front two paws on the bottom step and indicate, right, Mum, we're going upstairs. And you've either got the option where you can I can you can hold her hand hand um her harness handle and go up the stairs or you can drop it and take the lead. But I I just hold on to the harness. And she's so cute because when we're going up the stairs, she goes really slowly and I can see her and my peripheral vision kind of turn on as if right, you okay, you with me? Right, we'll carry on. She's just <laughs> she's so considerate. Oh. And then uh, she's she's honestly there they're worth her so waiting beautiful. for. They're, they're fabulous. And, and they don't even see it. I don't even think they see it as work. She's just so happy to be out with her mum. You know, yeah, she's just, yeah. she's, and I, they're amazing. They are amazing. And can can your dog find the lift button for you? Yeah. You know, Sometimes, oh obviously, because she's quite small. Autumn's only like 25 kilos. She's, yeah. quite, she's quite a small wee dainty thing. So she will, like, obviously sometimes the button's quite, it's higher up on the wall, yeah. but she will indicate where nose, where oh, it is, nice. like, kind of underneath it, but she will indicate it. Aye. Yep. Amazing. Oh, it's, she oh, sounds incredible. really beautiful. Paula, yeah. there's, um, you've obviously um, had, a, had a few dogs, so you've maybe sort of training's changed a little bit from the last dog you had. Is there anything new and your recent training that you hadn't had before that's a kind of newer thing that you have to learn? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'm on dog number three in a space of 10 years. So um, I lost my first dog due to he tore his cruciate ligament on his back leg, which was absolutely devastating because I, I finally got my dog where I wanted him and I was working him. And I was so, so happy. Just like Laura says, they become in tune with you and they become a part of you. And it gets to a stage you barely have to speak to them because they know instinctively they can read your shoulder work. So if you turn to the left, they're reading your shoulder work and they're moving automatically with you. It's an amazing, amazing feeling. Um, so he retired and then I got back on the list and uh, I got Frankie. Frankie was a, a golden lab. My first dog was a big black lab um, retrieved across. He was quite a handful. He was quite a lad, Jason. Um, I got Frankie. Now, I worked Frankie for just over two and a half years. Uh, Frankie was just over four when I chose to finish him. Uh, I took the decision because 
it was becoming very much apparent to me that he just didn't want to do it. He wanted to do everything else except be a guide dog. And you've got to think what these dogs do for you and how much they love you. Frankie absolutely adored me. I absolutely adored Frankie. But it just wasn't for him. And I kept trying to persevere with him. And I just, I constantly on the phone getting, seeking advice off guide dogs and how to do this, how to do that, which you do. And they're very, very good at that. Um, and I just, got to the stage where it's not working. Frank is just, he's, he's better off being a pet or whatever. So the hard thing, especially me, I've got ushers, so I've got the deafness as well as the RP and the eyes. I retired Frankie on November the 5th last year. Um, and then you're told it, you could wait potentially two years for another dog. So when you're heading into the winter on the shortest days, you all know the score. It's really dark, half past three, and it can be quite, it can drag you down. It can drag you down because you suddenly went from full mobility, like Laura says, to even watching the time for getting back and you're back on the cane. And it's not the same. It's really not the same. It's not, you don't feel the confidence as you do with a dog. Um I was very lucky. Jumbo came along. Jumbo has been out with someone else. Unfortunately, it never worked out for them. She's a smart little cookie. Um, so I qualified with Jumbo yesterday, and I also got word that Frankie has progressed to being a, a buddy dog. Oh, good. Oh, gosh. So it was quite emotional yesterday. <laughs> it was a uh, big day for me. Um, they're, they're part of your family, absolutely part of your family. I mean, I, I, I love them a bit. So each and every one is very, very special. But Frankie, I, I felt in in a way that I'd failed him. You know what I mean? And I never, I never, I, I knew that. I've had many discussions about it. But it was just the fact that he didn't want to do it. He wasn't cut out to do it. But for him to be a buddy dog with a young child who's who's blind, visually impaired, that's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. For me to get Jumbo, she is a very special dog. She's just like Autumn. She does everything that Autumn does, and she's absolutely fantastic. Um, the different ways of training now, I've had to really adjust. I've, I've, had, I've spent five weeks adjusting me. Laura will find the same thing. Um, you've got to totally adjust now to a different way of training. Where what they do is they, the dogs are all fed on dry food. Um, so you take some of the dry food out in the morning and put it in your pouch that guide dogs supply you, which is actually quite trendy this time round. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting fit, killer. Yeah, and, yeah, and the, a snack pack pro, they're quite good. <laughs> yeah. and, you, and you fit it on your belt and uh, it's like treat and reward. So what you do is... Uh, it's like Laura says, they're now pinpoint on the, the traffic lights and that, which is amazing because the dogs are so sharp, they're so accurate. Um, and what I'm finding is I can take her anywhere with, uh, for the first time and just feel totally relaxed as if they, they're really pinpointing traffic lights are looking for them. And it's just, it, it, it's pretty good. It, it's very good, in fact. And what I've been finding, because they asked me what routes I wanted to learn, I wanted to learn Glasgow City Centre because I live near Glasgow and I like sort of having a dog that's capable, that's very capable because I always need that. I always, I, I'm like Laura, I travel everywhere. Um, we go to London, we go to Inverness, we go to everywhere in between. So I need a dog that is capable. But to suddenly have a dog that you can take anywhere and just so alert, just looking for stuff all the time. She's she's pretty good. So what you do is you just, if you're, if you're asking the dog to look for something, like say if, you, if you're in the left, you just say, find the buttons, and she would pinpoint her nose to the buttons, and then you give her the wee treat. But as, as it goes on, you start weaning them off. So if you're on the same route all the time, you wean them off so they get it, and it's natural for them to do it. 
and then you just put the food back into the food at night. So they never go without, but you've always got to weigh the food out. Um, the main reason for that is you want your dog to be as fit as possible. You want your dog to have a happy, happy life. So um, the guide dogs are always pretty slim. They're pretty bang on the weight, or most of them should be. So um, it, that's the reason for that. So if you start giving them over what they're meant to be having, the dog will get bigger. You'll end up with, with problems with the dog. So it, it's good to keep them happy. I, I like to free run my dog every day as well. So if I'm going on the train, I'll give him a wee run through the park. Um, just or, or even on the way back, it just relaxes the dog so much. Um, let's say they're a big part of the family. We're very lucky in our house. My wife has got a guide dog. The problem we've got now is they're both just about identical. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and they're both about the same age and they're both about the same height, same size, same weight, everything. So uh, it's, uh, we're very, very blessed in that respect. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, the problem we've got is when we retire the dogs, it's Lynn's retired Eva, um, and she was very lucky because Eva went back to her original puppy walk of, up at Banff, and Lynn's folks come from Banff. So we're up there quite often, and we see Eva quite often, which is great. Um, Jason went to a couple at... The Grange um, at Errol Airport. Well, the funny thing was, I did. Uh, I finished Frankie last year on November the fifth, and I was feeling quite low as you do. And uh, I, I was doing a parachute jump on the Saturday after that. And someone on Facebook asked me, the lady that's got Jason asked me, "Where are you doing the jump?" And I says, I'm doing it at Errol Airport. And she says, do you mind if I bring Jason along? Now, it was two and a half years since I'd seen him and I couldn't bring myself to go and see him. I, I couldn't do it. So when she'd done that, it was just, again, emotions running high. Will the dog recognise me? And he did. He went absolutely crackers. And it's just, mm -hmm. it was just emotional. One thing with the guide dogs, it's uh, an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> the highs are so high, it's unbelievable. Um, when you have to give a dog up, it, it's it's mental. It's it's crazy, but the rewards are so good. I mean, I'm back back on track now. I feel so confident again. I'm just I'm buzzing, absolutely buzzing. I never slept much last night at all. Just. <laughs> <laughs> he's running a hundred mile an hour but um, it's just it's great to be back into that I, I, I can never see me without a dog it took me a long time I was like Laura I was struggling to get to the bus I was struggling to walk 100 yards you, you can be the same on a winter's night uh, and it was the fear of the white cane I, I know I thought that was just me and then I woke up to the fact that it's everybody where you have that fear of people seeing you and what they think. And the reality is it's you that thinks that. It's not anybody else that judges you. It's you that thinks that way. It takes you a long time to realise that. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's incredible. Thanks, Colin. Um, hopefully, hopefully, if, if, I, if I do get to um, to come up to, to one of your events um, this year, I'll get to, to, to meet Jumble. Um, I'd love to, to, to meet her. Well, she's an absolute superstar. Uh, she was in the office for quite a while. I think. She was. I've actually, um, she uh, she's actually been in my house. I've, I've kind of babysat her for a couple of hours as well in uh -huh. here. So she's really? she's an absolute sweetheart. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and and does guide dogs train German shepherds? Yes. Beautiful. Yep. <laughs> they, they train uh, German shepherds, Labradors, Golden Retrievers. We've, got, we've actually got a, a labradoodle in the office at the minute. His name's Glenn. He's uh, he's a he's a very noisy boy. Likes he's, he's likes to, Oh, he's, Kim, what lovely dog! <laughs> yeah, and we is. um we do um we've got crosses as well, so it could be cro like a shepherd retriever cross, a, a retriever labrador cross, the cotton. Um, aye, so they do. Yep. 
That's beautiful. Oh, what an inspiration. You guys are amazing. It's fantastic. Uh, do you reckon do you reckon you guys have got any um anyone any of your trainers with enough patience to train two English Springer Spaniels um, <laughs> that are completely and utterly crackers? I've tried getting one of them to guide me once before and I almost went under a car when they saw a cat. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Colin? You can say Fiona if she would like to train them. <laughs> yeah, Fiona trains gun dogs. Uh, yeah, no, that's where they're from. That's their heritage. Yeah, they're they're they're, they're uh, trained work, working dog heritage. So, but we don't actually. We're they're, they're our pets. We um we don't actually take them beating or anything like that. But they were they are from the uh, from from Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. So one one uh, one thing I will say is. Uh, the guide dogs, it becomes part of your family as well. Because uh, you get to know the trainers that well. I mean, there's, in the last three years, I've spent 10 weeks with my trainer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Constant phone calls and one thing or another. And it, it, it's, it's just so nice. You get to know them. Yeah. You, you become part of their family and... Uh, you get to know everybody firsthand. It was nice to be in the office yesterday and meet everybody again. And it, 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 it really, it, they, they've always said it's a guide dog family. And it is, it, it really, it, it's a nice environment. It's a nice place to be. It, it's nice people. Um, of course, the dogs are amazing. It's just, the dogs come first in the guide dog family. Though. You've got to remember that. The dogs come first. <laughs> <laughs> very much uh, that's brilliant thank you very very much everyone for for attending it's uh, the time's coming up to 10 past eight <laughs> now but i really do appreciate everyone coming and, and telling their stories and their experiences and and thanks to um emma for the services uh, that guide dogs provide and um and laura also for your experience as well that was a very very moving story um and very inspiring uh, for for anyone that wants to to get involved and get a guide dog or just seek out some of the other services that the guide dogs actually do provide um if um uh, emma if you've got any details you know links or anything how to people can get in touch then if you want to ping me an email we'll send out a follow-up email with the link to the youtube recording and any information that you would like to share as well, um, we, we can send that out to um, our community and the people that have, um, have registered, unfortunately, couldn't be with us this, this evening. So, um, but uh, a couple of um, bits and pieces um, to um, let you know of. Um, uh, we are very, very delighted to say that the Edinburgh Group and the Glasgow Group will be um, going uh, in-person meetings in uh, May. So on May 16th um, at 12 o'clock, um, we've been um, very kindly invited to Visibility where I'll get to meet Claire and the rest of the team. They've, they've invited us to um, have our first um, in-person meeting um, for, for quite a while at Visibility in Glasgow. Um, so all details are available on our website if you can make that meeting and then also Valerie and Jim um, I will be again coming up to Scotland very busy busy few days for me in Scotland so the 16th is Glasgow 17th I'll be in Edinburgh with uh, Valerie um, I think Jim is on holiday unfortunately but we will be uh, joined yeah. by a um, an echo from the Edinburgh um, I Pavilion yeah. that will talk about the services they provide and also I'll give a bit of a talk about my history with sight loss and my um, history past and present with Retina UK as I started out as a fundraiser and then if anybody can make it Retina UK will be hosting a information day in Aberdeen which will be going on our website very shortly with information how you can register for that one as well so if you do need any further information, our website is www.retinauk.org.uk. You can call the office on 01280 um, or you can email us at info at retinauk.org.uk to find out what's going on or where we will be in uh, Scotland um, from uh, May, middle of May. So... But uh, like I say, thank you everyone 
for attending this evening. I'll let you go off and get something to eat if you haven't already had your dinner. And uh, once again, thank you very, very much, Emma, for your um, for your talk and also to you, Laura, as well. And thanks, Colin, as well. It's so glad that you've uh, we were yeah. spoke before you um, you were gutted that you you lost your, your guide dog. But it's awesome that now you've got a new one. So I'll be very, very looking forward to, to coming up to one of your meetings this year. Didn't get to, to unfortunately meet you at your um, your one in March, but um, I would love to come up and um, and maybe talk at your next meeting or maybe one towards the end of the year and um, just let us know what dates you've got going on and I'll see whether I can be up there to uh, to support you for your next meeting yeah I'll give you a bill tomorrow Mark. yeah yeah no it'd be nice to catch up yeah it'd be nice to catch up I've got some ideas you know maybe um we can we can brainstorm or something but uh, very very much looking uh, forward to coming up uh, and uh, uh seeing you at Northern Alliance so excellent excellent thank you uh, Thank no you. worries. Thank you very much. Thank everyone. you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. us. No, and have Thank a lovely you. Take care. Bye bye, Thank everyone. You. Bye. 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 We hope you have enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions, queries, or wish to leave any feedback, then please leave it in the comment section below. Alternatively, you can send your inquiries to info at retina UK. Dot org dot uk. Contact us via the telephone on 01280 821 334 or call our helpline on 0300 111 4000 which is open Monday to Friday 9.30am to 9.30pm. If you would like to know more about our local peer groups when your next meeting will be held or if you wish to get involved in creating your own group, or would like to know more about our services that Retina UK provides, then please visit our information and support page on our website www.retinauk.org.uk and navigate to our local peer group page. Thanks again for listening. We hope to see you again soon. Take care and bye for now.